Beautiful. We're recording. Cynthia, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Guy. Love being with you today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I um, I, I, I'm a, what pricked my interest with you, Cynthia, is some of the topics you cover, and I'm like, wow, that goes quite deep. So I'm I'm really intrigued to see where this conversation goes today. And I'm always fascinated, so I'm going to start the show like I always do, especially with your background and knowledge. Um, if you were at a dinner table right now and you sat next to a complete stranger and they asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you say? Well, I just explained that I work with consciousness. I'm a spiritual life coach and an author about metaphysical topics. So I keep it kind of generic. <laughs> If they're interested, then they'll pursue. And if they're not, they're like, oh, okay, then. <laughs> Have you found people's response change, especially over the last couple of years as well? Like, more, uh, Do you find more people are wanting to look into this work? It's funny because in America, it seems like people were not interested much in this kind of work in general. Um, some 20 years ago when I started, when I was um, traveling through Europe, people were very interested, very respectful much to the embarrassment of my teenage daughters, like, oh my gosh, another person's asking mom what she's doing. I'm like, yeah, and they're interested and they respect this. <laughs> so I think that's changing in America. I think there have been some big changes over 20 years. Amazing. I've got to ask you, because looking at some of your topics, you talked about um, reality shifts, quantum jumps, the Mandela effect. Rev humanism, they, these are all these words that were, you know, you were sending me through and I'm like, wow, I, I mean, I'm aware of these topics, but they can go deep fast. What I'm intrigued by with you, Cynthia, is what led you to look into such subjects? Because it's not every day you meet people that what, not only want to talk about this, but study it and actually look very closely at all these things. Yes, I've well, I've had a, I've been kind of deep since early childhood. I've <laughs> I've been keenly interested in what's best for everyone, like wishing, blowing out candles on my birthday cake and wishing for the best for everyone, right from the beginning, just as a child, and um, with an awareness, remembering really that we are all consciousness, remembering that that's what I am, that I came from a deeper level of reality. So coming in with that awareness and really got me um, kind of propelled forward. And then I think I would have fallen off track, but if not for a massive Kundalini awakening when I was 32 years old in 1994. So that was huge for me. It was a big um, shake up, wake up call. And because I was trying to just live an ordinary life as a project manager, I studied physics at UC Berkeley. I got an MBA degree. I was just doing ordinary things or trying to blend in. Um, but my pr life purpose was never meant to be that, not not the true fulfillment of what I can really be here to do. So that that I'm sure that that's why I had such a spectacular Kundalini awakening experience, which I could not ignore as much as I might try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can totally understand. Did, what what were you looking for that at the time? Were you inquiring? Because it sounds like, you know, you're, 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 you're studying a degree, which is the complete opposite spectrum to doing the inner work. And what was there? Was that an accident? Was it something that you, you, you went after? Or was it just something that occurred from just meditating? Well, choosing physics came through meditation, partly and partly circumstance in a way, but that's also a kind of meditation. I, I really believe that what's inside is outside and often um, me trying to please my family, do something respectable, such a study, a hard science that my father would appreciate. He, he believed that math is the prince of the sciences. And, and so I thought, well, physics, that sounds pretty respectable. But on some deep level, I must have known that this was going to go straight into the heart of what I would most wish to get a degree in, which would be consciousness studies if UC Berkeley offered such a program, especially if they had mind matter interaction as part of it, which they did not. So at least not at that time. I just know of one PhD who successfully got through that A program, and that would be Jeffrey Mishlove. 
he did succeed in um, somehow squeaking through UC Berkeley with a doctorate in very metaphysical studies. That was unusual. <laughs> yeah, got it. So then what, I, I'm just fascinated because I had a similar experience about seven, eight years ago. And um, it obviously changed the trajectory of my life like it did yours, I'm guessing. With the steps you took to integrate or what, what, what did you do at the time? You know, did you think, right, I'm going to use, I'm just going to use my degree and just shoot down this rabbit hole now and start to get this work out there? Or did you sit there for a while? What, what happened? Well, it was kind of like pre Kundalini and post Kundalini is the best way to divide that topic. So before, before 94, when I was studying physics and getting my degree in business administration and thinking I'll be helping scientists. They seem like they need help organizing their thoughts. So management seems to make sense. Um, that was the pre Kundalini post Kundalini. Everything made sense differently. I suddenly realized that not a minute had been wasted. Everything I'd studied was very valuable, but not in the way that I may have originally thought. <laughs> and the stuff that had to do with quantum physics that I loved so much when I was studying physics, what would be at the core of my forward work with metaphysics. So it started making a lot of sense, but it was, it took me about five years to integrate that Kundalini experience and wow. start coming forward. It takes time. Everything seemed to fall apart first. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It's amazing how much we don't realize that we've identified of who we are, what we, who we think we are and our, our roles, our name, everything just kind of, can evaporate quite quickly and, and then you begin to rebuild. But for me, you know, not to scare people, yeah, you know, I still think it's the greatest gift that could have ever happened, to be honest with you, because you start to, um, uh, I guess you have a deeper connection with everything and everyone and, and the planet we live on. And, and from that space, um, builds more love and compassion, I, I found in my own journey. And it's been a beautiful journey from that. I found that too. And it took me time to trust that process to, to really trust. It felt like stepping onto thin air, like, like what is holding me up now? <laughs> like, because I'd been depending on this material realistic paradigm and, and now to totally trust intuition, to do everything based on that, that was um, really went against my, um, my long patterns of consciousness. What had been trained into me through my family, through the culture, it just seemed like, wow, this is very different. But it, it brought me right back to being a child again and real, remembering that I had had this um, early life experience of trusting basically angelic realms, asking a thought question, getting a thought answer. It would be correct and trusting that more than pretty much anything else. And, mm -hmm. and then after Kundalini, realizing I am returning to that. Like, oh boy, <laughs> like, because it felt like this will be hard to justify to people, hard to explain possibly. <clears throat> so it was kind of challenging. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to mention as well, because I, I get the feeling that people might be listening to this going, oh, do I have to have this experience <laughs> to then connect to everything? And I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the case at all. No, no. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that for me, the Kundalini experience was necessary to <clears throat> kind of propel me to a, a level of involvement that I would never normally have sought. It would not have been something that would feel like part of my life trajectory. And because it was necessary, then I needed that kind of a wake up, shake up of the Kundalini to recognize that there are much deeper fundamental consciousness levels um, that are operating everything that we think is real and to get yeah. a real inundation in that so that it was became impossible to refute although i did try i mean i was trying to in the initial phases i'll admit i was trying to push it away like i think i'm losing my mind <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and, and body in it so <laughs> maybe let's dive in there a little bit because um I, I heard you speak about the nine levels of consciousness before, and I think that might be yes. a nice place to to take this conversation mm. now from that point. Oh, that's so, deep. Abs yes. So please okay, I dive do in. touch on it. <laughs> yeah, it's mentioned briefly in my book, Reality Shifts, When Consciousness Changes the Physical World, but I don't explain exactly 
why it matters so much to me personally or what happens. And you're right. You're exactly on it. It was part of a Kundalini for sure. Um, so it was an introduction where I was getting information about um, sort of a back and forth conversation as would ha often happen in the Kundalini awakening where I would be prompted to pay attention to which levels of consciousness am I looking with right now kind of like if like if you were to ask me Cynthia are your eyes open and I would say no and like now they're open so it's it's kind of like that but for um, paying attention to uh, dimensional consciousness and so I was getting an awareness that just like we play a piano on the keyboard, there are frequencies that we're playing from the low register to the high. And so we can um, we can play each note individually. And so the first um, frequency of consciousness that I was introduced to would be a point source where there it's like a point of consciousness, like a photon, just like an electron or quantum particle. So it would be the consciousness of a photon. Let there be light. Boom. You know, that experience of being all that is. And it's a very pure, um, beautiful state of consciousness. And then the second dimension of consciousness that I experienced was the dream, the, the photon's a dream. So it's realizing that now you can roam through space time and you can dance back and forth from being everywhere at once to experiencing it as you flow and then back to everywhere at once. And so it's really like being um, particle or wave. It's um, coming in and out of sleep, coming in and out of that dream experience. The third dimensional consciousness is our regular uh, dimensions of space, like the X, Y, Z axis. So it's kind of 3D living. Um, but actually, we usually dream. So we go through time as well. And then we have that same fun experience of deja vu, future memory, seeing things um, from meditation and recognizing possible futures, possible pasts, other people's lives, how we're connected, that sort of thing. And then the fifth dimension, and, and I was I was showing to look at my hands. So I'd be looking at my hand. I'd be going one, two, three, four. Now we're getting to five. Five is imagining five dimensions. And that's getting a little interesting. Like, what does that even look like topographically? Hard to imagine, but but we feel it. It's if it, This starts feeling like the astral body. Like this is how when we really travel, we know that we're connected to reality at a higher level. We're seeing more colors. The ranges that we're open to witness are getting broader. High sense perception is just natural. And then we come into the next hand. That's not an accident. That's like six was the next level that I came in at. Six was very much the dream space of the fifth. There could still be, if I was to interact with other individuals at level five, there might be disagreements. Um, dreaming together can help um, bring some shared coherence back to the group. But it isn't until seven, seventh dimensional consciousness, that really it's all thinking like one. There's the, it's built in. Everyone knows, oh, we really are all connected. Let's all respect one another. And it's just so automatic, so beautiful. And, and never forgetting that we're always of this spiritual basis. So it's, it's got a dimensional quality, too, of seven dimensions, which feels very high vibratory. Eight would be bringing in a dream sequence to that. And it starts getting interesting there as well, because um, the um, seven was so excellent. Then you might ask, well, what's the difference with eight? And that is very, it's so subtle. It's For us, it might be hard to tell, because unless you meditate a lot, you might not know what that difference is. But... Um, you can see a huge difference when you get to ninth dimensional consciousness because everything that's thought manifests when one is playing that ninth dimensional key on that ninth dimensional piano. It's like anything you think. So this is where it really helps to be have, have done a lot of internal work so that there is no tendency to re react into fear, sadness, or anger so that, that one is always in a very centered peaceful, um, balanced state so that whatever one encounters can be greeted openly uh, without having a knee-jerk reaction that might be unfortunate. And then 10 would be kind of getting up into the dream space of that causal consciousness, which can really feel like dreaming with God. It feels like co-creating with, with um, zero entropy, with 
with causality with the creator. So uh, I was then given to constantly look at what chords am I playing? Like, like notice, am I playing one or two or three? And often I would be. So that got really interesting to see how we play with chords of consciousness. And one is not better than another. Being a photon is pretty fabulous. They're all fabulous. So to help break that down to the listeners and myself, <laughs> um, yeah. if we are human beings, and I, and this is my just my belief system now that we are photons of light stuffed into a physical mammal body, and I have a relationship with it. I am not it. We are inter intertwined to have a human experience. So that means my consciousness, is like I, I always look at myself like a nerve ending, able to have um, information received to send back to source consciousness and and the greater my experience of through my life the more information and the more expansion the greater consciousness can experience so with that then the nine levels of consciousness are you saying that we are they are nine frequencies that we can experience at any given moment and develop to allow us to have a more human experience on a different vibration moment yes moment. it's like it's like music it's uh, there's free will on each of those levels so the photon level is like having the identity of a one-dimensional being and being a three-dimensional being feels normal for us we're told that's what we are but then we notice we're moving through time so then we think well maybe four dimensions and then some of us start astral traveling and lucid dreaming then like okay five dimensions and then like and then that gets as we keep going up that that ladder of <laughs> higher levels we notice wait there's more stuff up here and sometimes you get to that place where you are so elevated that whatever you think does happen people are noticing that they're noticed that they'll have a question and it gets answered um you know instantly and so that's that causal level uh -huh. ken wilbur I, what blew my mind is when I came across all of this and it was told to me by a dragon, which sounds kind of crazy, <laughs> but it was like, I was, it's the Kundalini. <laughs> so it's like, I swear no drugs were involved. <laughs> it's like, the dragon is quite real. So the dragon shared this with me. It's like, just observe. I'm like, okay. So anyway, it, <laughs> but when I saw that Ken Wilbur had um, covered some of this exactly in his book, A Brief History of Everything, I think it's in the second part of his book and I'd already received this from the dragon. And then here it is in the book. Wow. I, then I realized this is true and people are getting this directly. And that's the way information always uh, reaches us. So humans often give ourselves a lot of credit for inventing something when actually the ideas seem like they're flowing through direct from consciousness. We can be conduits. We have free will. We can choose. But I think a little humility is in order for all of that. Isn't it so? Isn't it so? Reverence as, as yeah. we, we, we bring into each moment. And I think that has been one of my greatest lessons, to be honest with you, right there, humility and actually trying to bring in a beginner's mind to everything um, e each day. And, and I fall from grace all the time. I forget to do it. But but also it's it's there and, and it's a fundamental shift i feel that um, has happened because once you start to have these experiences you realize there's a lot you don't know and the more you lean in the more you realize you don't know and from that space then um we, we get to learn from a very different vantage point and uh, hopefully apply it in our lives you know right well applying is where we really learn it i think it's like it feels like then it becomes something hopefully we won't forget in any reality. Um, it seems like there are these, all these possible or probable realities that we're moving through all the time. And we can access that when we play with these levels of consciousness as well. Well, let's dive in there next because this is flowing along amazingly. So is this way you, you start to get into your, your book, Reality Shifts from, yes. from that space? So exactly. Yeah. Please explain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think most people have noticed that sometimes things seem to move around of their own accord. It's like um, we might set our keys down or put
put something down and then you, you come back and it's not where you thought you put it. So that would be what I've been calling reality shifts. And author PMH Atwater also mentioned reality shifts in her book called Future Memory. Both of our books came out in 1999. Prior to that, I have subsequently found Mary Rose Barrington from England. Uh, she had been documenting something she called just one of those things or jot. <laughs> and so I want to give her credit. I didn't hear about her until only very recently. So for decades, I'd been <laughs> dedicating my life's work to the subject of reality shifts. But I, obviously, she was tracking it back to the early 1900s. And I think she's got some recorded experiences that go back even prior to that. It's That's important because this idea that we we have a mind matter interaction going on where our thoughts and our feelings are very related to our outer environment. So we can witness things like synchronicity, which I would call a form of reality shift. Uh, we can notice it, when we do laundry, we might lose a sock in the washer or dryer. <laughs> and we might notice things seem to move around. So things appear, disappear, transform, transport. We notice changes in time. All of these things happen. And they're all what I would call reality shifts. So it, it's, it's an interesting experience when it happens, because if we stay in that beginner's mind, then it can be fun. It can be magical. Like, what's going on? And sometimes whatever vanished can come back. Sometimes something that you need appears out of nowhere. When you know you didn't have it, it could be, I've had money come in that way into my bank account, into my wallet. So it, these things can be very helpful. And it does get to be fun. So it doesn't need to be alarming or nerve wracking. It can just, mm. um, people tend to experience problematic reality shifts when they're energized, but ungrounded. And then going through agitation of fear or anger. So it's kind of like a bad feedback system. And they, that's what it looks like to me. So that would be where they keep losing things. Things keep vanishing. They're in it. They're in a big hurry. It's like we have to go. We're late. And then they get angry. And then their item is missing. And then it's completely missing. And nobody can find it. And it's what they consider a disaster. So it's. I think this is a training ground for all of us to practice because I think we're starting to see this collectively now, in the form of Mandela effects. Which I'll definitely jump into in in, in a moment, but. With the so, how do we then use that to our advantage? I'm I'm kind of looking at it like bringing humility back into everything and thinking that actually the the the, the outcome is not set in stone. You there is a potential to have a different outcome in any moment if I'm open to it. Would that be the right way of looking at it? Or yes, oh, I love that. I I like to retrain the brain to ask how good can it get to because um, we, it seems like we've inadvertently often picked up an unfortunate tendency uh, where we're, you'll hear people say this like what next like now I lost my keys now I lost my wallet oh my gosh what next and, and it's like okay cancel cancel that <laughs> let's ask how good can it get <laughs> and maybe you never know and <clears throat> that really is the beginner's mind it's really optimism and it's getting into that state, like you said, the beginner's mind where anything is possible and wonderful things are possible in any moment, including flat out miracles, which I've seen so many of. Wow. It just goes to show, doesn't it? I, I um and I and I've and I catch myself still doing it. Sometimes you just shut somebody will suggest something to you, or when you have that a go, why didn't you just put it out there to the universe? And and quite so often we can just shut things down before even um, just allowing to be where well, it's like, why not? Why can't that be a different outcome? Why, why does it have to go that way? And we're such creatures of habit and we, we do the same things over and over again every day that we just then forget that there's so much more to it. There's so much more potential. There's so much more opportunity. There's so many other things we could be focusing on at any given moment, yet we are actually choosing this in this moment. Yeah. It seems like we've um, sort of fallen asleep in, inside the dream and we need, we're now waking up. I think the Kundalini can wake us up, but so can regular meditation or just listening to your podcast. You know, someone can be listening and suddenly 
just this conversation can activate within a person that potential that they already feel is there to start experiencing some good things that how good can it get mindset yeah totally well before we move on to mandala effects i'm I'm definitely curious about because that twisted my brain a bit when when i first heard that um how have you found the last few years in your belief because you you talked about the hopi prophecy rock and and that really pricked my interest as well and given the, the very fact of the last few years that we've been going through what are your thoughts on all of that coming together if you could explain the, the hopi prophecy rock as well in relation to maybe what's been happening in the world <clears throat> Right. Well, I'm not a Hopi, so I should definitely get the disclaimer out of the way. But I have written an article about comes true being hoped for, which is the language of the Hopi. They 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 talk with verbs. They have the verbs tunatya and tunatyava, and they understand this mind matter interaction we're speaking of. They also have a beautiful history, and to them, it's 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 real. It, we might call it like um, what do you call it? fantasy or tradition or folklore but to them it's a an oral tradition history where they say that we've gone through the ending of the world three times before this is the fourth world and we're about to go into the fifth so this is by way of a little bit of background um the article i wrote is for parabola this threshold magazine many years ago and i was fascinated by the hopi and well it's a whole lot other story but but the key here is when you look at their prophecy rock then you see um, one of the central tenets of their um, spirituality and of their wisdom which is to show that we humans have always had a choice and that we continue to have a choice uh, where the creator gives us great possibility that we can uh, continue living in harmony with the living things on the earth and with each other and you know keeping our crown chakra our kopavi open so that we can have these spiritual experiences and also get guidance and intuition and ideas that we know may not be ours but we can receive them and then keep our hearts open too that's really the beginner mindset the beginner heart of the hopi and so when when we look at the the prophecy rock we see down at the lower left there's the creator and he's sort of offering to the humans like okay you can proceed and off you go <laughs> and so one path is, is kind of closer to the earth and it's to me, it looks very um, basic with farming and working with, you know, being a guardian for the planet, for the other beings, and really staying in a good harmonious relationship that way. And the upper level looks to me like um, these kind of robotic beings. They start off kind of looking like they're marching along and all shiny and looking like it's all going great, but then they just fizzle out and vanish. So if I think people interpret this stone different ways, but I think it's agreed upon that that upper path, it really vanishes. And that is not the recommended way to go. I think it's interesting that it looks like it literally turns into little AI robots and then vanishes like poof. Yeah. I think that's very interesting because when people first saw this rock carving, we didn't have the idea of anything like Neuralink or artificial intelligence or Boston robotics, all these things we have now. And who knows where that's going but it seems clear to me that there is another alternative to transhumanism so when i see the prophecy rock i think well there we have it we've got transhumanism where people for whatever reason think they can put their brains into a cloud which i would not recommend i, I do not recommend that <laughs> or <laughs> we can stay in connection with each other and i i just come came up with the term rev humanism based on this ancient Latin um, root of rev, which is revitalizing, it's regenerating, growing. It's, it's a very natural word. And I think it's returning us to our roots of uh, who we really are as spiritual beings. I stayed because I didn't know what, what else to do. <laughs> I <clears throat> checked to see if you sent me an email, but I thought. <laughs> no, you did, the right, <laughs> okay. you did the right thing. I am um, still recording. <laughs> I'll send you a link as well. So hopefully the, the I was just looking at my file, but if okay. it, should, it should be fine. If not, we'll be able to okay. retrieve what we recorded. Can you remember where you okay, were? Perfect. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I was talking about the Hopi and the, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Rev Humanism. 
Yes. Maybe we pick it up from there. Yes. Just say when. Just go, for say go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Well, to me, rev humanism is very important for these times because it gives us a sense of the ability um, that we can take these ideas of being a photon in a meat suit, as you put it. <laughs> I love that. And and really revitalize ourselves. We can give ourselves hope um, through this connection with with creator, with zero entropy, with source, whatever you want to call that. Because no matter what things look like, there's always hope. There's there's the ability for this any situation to be transcended and not by taking a shortcut and thinking that someone else will solve a problem, but instead by choosing to stay positive, choosing a beginner's mind, choosing to embrace uncertainty without be slipping into a reaction of fear or anger or grief or sadness. Mm -hmm. So it's really an internal spiritual um, invitation. I think that Rev Humanism is presenting us with the opportunity to be the guardians for the earth, for ourselves, for one another, to move into this fifth world, hopefully with minimal um, damage. I, I think by asking together, how good can it get? I know we can avoid a lot of just unnecessary drama and crisis. So we can sort of quantum jump, hop and skip our way forward together. It would certainly be nice, that's for sure. Are you are you optimistic with the future? With the, I am. Every, yeah. And that's despite hardships. I, I did go through um, long COVID. So I did come down with an early case of COVID before it was supposed to be in the United States last week of January 2020. And then fortunately, um, I see it as a fortunate thing now. I, I got long COVID February through, that was February 2020, and I had it through June of 2021 with the symptoms and the relapses and everything. And But I, I consider myself fortunate because I felt like I could, by asking how good can it get, I kept seeing what the gift was in the challenge. And I think that's very key for, for those of us who are optimists to be realistic. So this is not called blind optimism or stupid or foolish optimism. It's very practical optimism. It's recognizing, okay, it's like if you're golfing and you end up in the sand pit, we're in the sand pit. Okay, this, this could be pretty bad. People might say that, but how good can it get? What is the blessing now that we have long COVID or fell in a sand trap or lost our job or what have you, what is the blessing? What's the silver lining? What is the gift? What is going to come out of this that might never otherwise have been? And looking for that is what can make us truly um, beautiful gifts to one another. We are each other's treasure that way. I absolutely love that question. How good can it get? That's going to be my new mantra. I'll keep you posted. I, I'm, I'm going to st stick it in places for the next months and where I see it most and, and continue to remind myself, how good can it get? It's such a beautiful way of looking at everything. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I, I'm bracing myself, but let's jump into the Mandela effect because I know let's loop back around to that point. And... Um, I'm also intrigued why what what pricked your interest into into looking at that as well because it's it's quite a theme. <clears throat> well, my experience with the reality shifts, if you read my book Re Reality Shifts when consciousness changes the physical world, you'll notice that was the first written report of a celebrity being alive again. I mentioned Larry Hagman. We don't call it the Hagman effect, although I've met a couple of other people that noticed he was alive again. <laughs> But it's not such a big thing. It, most people in the world, it didn't really um, trigger this huge tsunami wave of excitement. Like, what happened to Larry Hagman? Maybe one or two or three of us noticed. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> I, th I, I thought it was astonishing at the time. It was so radical that I put it in the book because I knew for sure it did happen. And I wanted to give people permission to acknowledge these kinds of experiences, even though I don't think Mary Rose Barrington quite went there. I think she was mostly focusing on things. 
<clears throat> so her research didn't probably cover that, at least last time I looked. Sometimes things change. I'd be excited to see if her work now at some point might include people or animals being alive again. Um, but I also included a story about a cat being alive again in reality shifts. So I had a person, I had a cat. And now we know that the term Mandela effect comes from people noticing around the year 2009 that um, there was sort of that tipping point where there were enough people finally noticing something's going on. There is um, something strange here because enough people notice we collectively remember that Nelson Mandela did die. We remember and agree on the specifics that he was still imprisoned on Robbins Island. Some people remember all kinds of details like the legal issues with his widow and so forth. And then the current reality is that he died, um, you know, several years ago now, but not back in the eighties. So that's the big Mandela effect itself, but it's just one type of collective um, different mem remembering. So a true Mandela effect is where a group of people would remember something differently. And with the research studies that I've conducted on reality shifts, it's always been a group activity. It's very, very frequently the case that a, two or three or more people together would remember something differently. This has been going on for a long time. So I think that it, that Mandela effect was right there in my book, Reality Shifts. It's just that now we have a new name for it and we're mostly focusing on the group side of things, whereas individuals might experience a personal reality shift or a personal Mandela effect. But it's the same phenomenon, basically. So what does that actually mean then? Does that mean we have, there's a lot of potentials in the field of information or there's timelines per se and then we're actually jumping into a different outcome while other parts of consciousness aren't is that what's going on or? it's like we're playing with it right now because um most people if you look at it you can take these quizzes about mandela effects that you might that resonate for you that might seem true to you and other ones might or might not depending on what you're paying attention to what you're interested in and so forth um, and you're right, they, um, this, this whole phenomenon gives humanity the capability to recognize that changes in our bodies can happen, such as, uh, for me, a big one is the kidney punch. Uh, it's still called a kidney punch, and many of us, it's where if you're boxing or doing martial arts, you know not to strike someone in their lower back in a certain area, because if you hit to strike with too much force in that area, it can precipitate serious damage to the kidneys which would be as evidenced through blood in the urine and so forth and sometimes death now um, the kidneys are no longer in that area where we know the kidney punch to be so it, it's it's kind of shocking um, you know these kind of things are like what happened <laughs> when you find out that the kidneys have moved upward um, to the relative safety of the rib cage they're a little bit higher than they used to be and it's such a degree that now surgeons will um, check on people's kidneys differently than they used to. I've, I've heard from people who remember every time they went to get their kidneys uh, checked by the doctor, the, the doctor would check their lower back. Now they go in through the front and it's, it's higher. So it's just really that kind of thing is indicating this could be an improvement of all of our bodies. It, it, it's the experience of basically something that we might have called evolutionary shift or an evolutionary jump, but we're not really um, giving it that kind of credit because it just happens in the background, sort of only for those of us that remember it used to be different. Is it huh. different at all? And does that lean into then the observer effect? You, you know how the cat's not in the box or is it alive or dead in the box until, and it's not until you look, you actually have evidence. So is, are we now leaning into sort of the, that whole quantum theory of only once we observe it's going to come into form and that's where coming into form the information can change? Yes, that, uh, that, um, that whole thing with the Schrodinger's cat, that's the uh, physicist Erwin Sch Schrodinger. He came up with that thought experiment, Gedanken experiment, and then subsequent physicists such as John Archibald Wheeler 
were indicating we clearly live in a participatory universe. It's participatory, absolutely, because as we observe, we are indeed affecting what we are observing. And it's, it's very interesting because um, this whole idea it might seem like science fiction. It might seem like, like this can't be something that it can't be something we'd ever see in the laboratory, but we do see it in the laboratory. Uh, we're now witnessing it in experiments that are um, running these, the double slit experiment with two observational devices that pick up two completely different realities at the same place at the same time which is indicating that that subjective quality of reality seems to be built into reality itself, which means it's it's not something that physicists can sweep under the rug quite so easily. I know a lot of physicists would love to do that. Um, they don't, they just want to shut up and calculate. It's easier not to include consciousness. It's easier to just stick with the mathematics, in other words. But when we look at what is going on, who are we, which is to me the ultimate question, who are we really? Mm -hmm. and, and when you meditate and you start noticing that you've got levels of consciousness with which you observe, then you can start playing with this mind matter interaction. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I love it. I love it. Just, just to sort of tie up the conversation and, and as we come to the end of the podcast, Cynthia, what are there, do you have suggestions? What, what if somebody's listening to this now and they go, Oh my god, that's all just like what you know, that's amazing. And then I've still got to get up and I'm not happy with my circumstances and this, and you know, and all of a sudden it becomes a theoretical conversation that was interesting. And, and then they go back into the, the day, their problems, and whatever's going on with all that you know and have learned yourself. What would be a few simple tools to start leaning into or to even have fun with this at the same time to just to get going what would you suggest well the fun one that i love of course is just keep asking how good can it get ask it even when you feel like are they kidding you know are guy and cynthia like what are they suggesting this is all messed up i'm going to ask that it's a joke how good can it get but but try to do it with <laughs> with a little beginner's mind there you know just with the possibility, what if things actually could spin correctly up and out of the downward spiral that it looks like it's going? You know, give it a chance. How good could it get? Really give everything a chance. Give everyone a chance, yourself and every situation. So that's that's a good way to do it. Um, I love the beginner's mind idea. Just practicing meditation to start turning off that rational, analytical left brain that's just mm -hmm. such a chatter, chatter, chatter. So practice just getting a few moments and then a few minutes and maybe larger and larger parts of the day with that switched off. So you can receive direct intuitive insight, which is where we can find that you're connected to everyone and everything. And you can start experiencing a grace of living without struggling so hard. And you'll start feeling that there's a support that's naturally happening always and that you're never alone. Some of the beliefs that we have are very um, counterproductive. <laughs> so the, the how good can it get will be helping to offset some of that and practicing beginner's mind. Then it's like a one, two, you can just kind of step forward, beginner's mind, how good can it get beginner's mind? And you'll see progress. Love it. Love it. And do you, do you have any practices in your, your own life? Or is it more now that you've embodied it and you kind of just live it? Or do you still do you still have a regular meditation practice or is it off and on or what do you do these days? Yeah, I do. Well, I do a lot of different meditations. I like walking meditation a lot. Um, I used to listen to music too, but lately I've just, I like listening to nature. So I just like to sit um, in the garden or meditate outside. It's, it's beautiful that way if the weather's good. <laughs> and I like to meditate before I fall asleep and when I wake up, I like, so pretty much any chance that I can bring meditation into a moment, I like to do that. Mm -hmm. And one simple meditation is just a clearing meditation, observing just what's happening physiologically inside me and just relaxing, just clearing any kind of stress out yeah. so that it's, again, feeling that beginner's mind beingness. So I, I just do several different types of meditation, um, just combining you know, breath and movement and mm -hmm. imagination if I can. The Qigong types are wonderful. I like those. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, that alone is massive, isn't it? I mean, you know, I we hold workshops here in Australia and, it, you know, the, the biggest thing is that we're in our heads constantly and we are so removed and disconnected from our bodies. It blows my mind, you know, and I was guilty of that too, you know, and just like you say, having that practice of just shifting your awareness, just off your problems for a moment and seeing where you're holding it in your body can be, can be revolutionary just doing that you know and then you can connect sometimes to nature the way the hopi prophecy rock shows i was meditating in my garden and watching a squirrel taking a tiny little apples off of our tree and burying them it was taking all the little ones it could carry and i i wondered what the squirrels do and why the apples all vanish at one point and there i'm getting to see it so i just sat there for 20 minutes of silence until I thought, well, I need to go in the house. So I very respectfully stood up slowly, went back inside the house. About half an hour later, I came out and the biggest apple from the tree was sitting at the base of the chair. Obviously the squirrel had brought me the biggest, best apple from the tree. And it did that again the next day. There was a, it brought it to that chair where I'd been meditating. Like, wow. So magic can happen in our worlds. Magic can happen in our life. Absolutely amazing. It just makes me want to mention the book for listeners as well. That I've been, I just literally finished a book called The Secrets of Aboriginal Healing. And oh. what a book. And I highly recommend people to give it a go. But they, they talk about dream time and um, as part of that. And that is that because I wonder, I was going to mention it earlier, but that's that emergence with the field. And, um, and they, the, the, within the book, the culture had been just are not involved in. Um, was Western man, so they, they live off the land. They live very simply, but true to their true to their culture. And uh, they they brought a white man in to heal for the first time in forty years, and he couldn't understand why they weren't talking to each other. And he's like, "Well, what's going on?" He said, "Well, they're actually communicating telepathically. They don't need to use words much because they're so connected." And it just right. blows my mind. It blows my mind what's possible once we become still. <laughs> I know. Well, my I have one daughter. When she went to college, she, she was concerned. She said, Mom, I'm afraid to go to college. And I said, why? She said, because they won't know what I'm thinking the way you do. Like, she would just think things to me. I'd think them back. And she's like, this is not going to work. I said, you'll be fine. But but she was really nervous. Wow. So so we can we can bring that into our life, too. It's It's here for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And last question for you, Cynthia, that I ask everyone on the show is with everything we've covered today, what would you like to leave our listeners to ponder on? Ah, who do you see yourself being? Who do you feel like you really are at all the levels of your being? You know, how can you come to better appreciate, respect and enjoy being you? beautiful Cynthia thank you so much for uh, coming on today where can we send people if they want to find more about your work your books everything that you do what's the best place well, my website realityshifters.com I've got a monthly newsletter and free gifts for people who subscribe and it's always an update that's fun with firsthand reports of reality shifts Mandela effects and all the latest news in those areas Amazing. And the, the, your links will be in the show notes for everyone as well. So if you're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, doesn't matter. Uh, you just need to go into the, the show notes below and it will be there for you. Cynthia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Mm -hmm. I, I love everything that you're about. It was an amazing conversation. And I, I'm i pretty sure everyone that, that, that's still listening right now got a lot out of it as well today. So thank you, my lovely. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.